Hey, B Sides Atlanta, this is Mike Doyle. Uh, I am a principal consultant with Synopsys. Um, I guess a little quick introduction about Synopsys. Synopsys is a big software company. They make software for people who uh, 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 make hardware. Um, but we are security consultants. Um, they acquired our company, Sigital, about three-ish years ago. Um, so we still do the same work that we did before, I guess. Dia? Yeah. Yes. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Deyasvina Ghosh. I work as a security consultant at Synopsys Atlanta. Uh, and being a technical consultant, I worked on various application security projects that include um, source code review, web app, and network penetration testing, malicious code detection, um, part of which we are going to talk about today. So without further ado, let's begin our presentation. All right. So uh, this morning, if you uh, were in this uh, track and you saw Eddie Glenn's talk, um, one of the things that he said is that um, like nearly every business nowadays seems to be a software business. Um, and then uh, 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 certainly that's the case. Now Eddie was talking about a rather similar uh, topic. He was coming at securing software supply chains from a, uh, a code signing perspective. We're going to talk about it a little bit different. Um, uh, we work with lots of organizations that make software. And like Sean Marshall said in just the previous uh, 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 track here, or the previous uh, uh, time period, um, almost all of your code was written by somebody else somewhere else. Um, so uh, when it comes to the software that's getting made, um, how trustworthy are the people in the organizations that make it is what we're concerning ourselves with. So we're going to describe the problem in a little bit more depth, um, examine the motives that uh, uh, malicious software developers might have, um, and then we're going to take you through our process for discovering attack vectors, um, tell you how to take action uh, for these sort of things, and then we want to wrap up by talking about who can detect these sort of threats. All right, so I've got some uh, news stories here on the, uh, uh, on the screen. Um, if you take a look at, and you know, but feel free to like, you know, Google these later or something like that, but the, uh, the one in the upper right that you see from Security Week um, is a story about a contractor who developed a set of Excel spreadsheets with like, you know, fancy macros and stuff. Um, for uh, his, uh, his employer was Siemens, a uh, big manufacturing firm out of Germany. So uh, he built these macros in such a way, since he was going to be the person responsible for maintaining them on a contract basis, he actually put like the logic bombs inside of the Excel macros so that they would break themselves every so often, just to give them a chance to come in and make some recurring revenue off of them. Um, down in the lower left is a story from the register um, about a Atlanta-based contractor, he's a, a base right here in our city, um, who attacked the United States Army to, to the tune of $2.6 million in damages. Um, and then the story down in the lower right is about a, a direct employee for UBS um, he was disgruntled over a lower than expected bonus check. He only got $36,000 in his bonus. Um, so he developed a set of logic bombs that he had deployed to over 2,000 servers. He left the company, uh, went right to his broker, and then shorted their stock. So the uh, the gist here is that we we place a lot of trust in the folks that make our software. Certainly, B sides Atlanta would not be a conference today. We wouldn't be conferring without software. We're very dependent on it. But the trust we put into the people that make it could very well be uh, misplaced. Next slide. So, what is software supply chain threat detection? Firstly, it is not same as uh, malware detection. Traditional malware is built by an outside attacker to compromise systems. This is an emerging science to identify groups of suspicious functionalities and malcode 
that looks like regular code, but it is built and inserted by developers uh, or an insider who is internal to the software supply chain. We could also take this as a spin-off from um, regular so source code review, but the main difference is that the focus is not to just identify implementation bugs and design flaws, rather the focus is to um, analyze the business logic from the perspective that is my production deployed source code secure from an insider threat? Another main difference is that we do not just analyze uh, source code files. Uh, the input we consider for this kind of detection um, is that binaries from the production environment. And why do we do that? Um, let's take an example. Uh, there is an app team um, which has built a source code. It has undergone a source code review in the development cycle. There were bugs that were fixed in the development cycle itself and there was a green signal given um, for releasing the source code to production from the security team and the production uh, and from the senior management. But a couple of weeks after the production release, somebody identified a backdoor from a bug bounty program. Uh, this is not very uncommon. And this is because malicious code can be injected in the executables as late as the final production build. So it could be anybody in the internal software supply chain who could possibly be a threat. In this case, we are focusing on the software app teams. Um, the next question is that uh, mostly for people, uh, you know, for part of an app team or an organization, already source code reviews are performed, vulnerability assessments are being done. Do we need another uh, threat detection as a part of the pre-deployment process? And uh, to answer this question, we can ask ourselves a few follow-up questions. Um, starting with, is the software outsourced? Um, if I have acquired the software through a merger and acquisition kind of an activity, um, do I know if my software is healthy or not? Um, if it's outsourced, then if the development team on site or is it offshore and uh, what are the rights do I have on the binary packages? So all these questions basically um, give us clues on what could be the motive behind such uh, threats in the software supply chain. So a couple uh, of aspects about, about this. Um, first of all, when it comes to attribution, um, more times than not, when these sort of uh, uh, problem malicious constructs find their way into software, um, into source code, it comes from uh, outsourced contractors more typically than uh, disgruntled employees. The, uh, 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 the examples that we gave at the beginning of the presentation, um, you know, the three examples, two of which were, uh, were contractors. Um, furthermore, the more socially distant those contractors are, which is to say, like, you know, the longer the supply chain, um, the, uh, the more likely it is for, uh, uh, for, a, developer, uh, for a dev to, uh, I guess, go rogue and, and, and be uh, compelled to uh, make these sort of um, uh, uh, problem areas. Um, something else I want to talk about, though, is that we can't prove intent just by looking at the source code. Um, a construct could uh, come to us, we could find it, it could be, it could look accidental. Um, it could actually be an accident. Um, it might be a lapse of training or um, an adherence to standards, uh, like coding standards, a lack of business knowledge, that sort of thing. Um, uh, also, a developer who uh, wants to um, evade uh, punishment could set something up to make it look very accidental, even though it was actually malicious. Now, when we get to uh, one of our later slides, when we talk about what to do with the results, um, we can talk about additional steps that you can take to sort of prove out intent. Um, uh, uh, but we're typically talking about um, developers or IT folks or, or, or you know, now that, uh, uh, you know, can, uh, like your network is code, um, your network is software. 
um, anybody with access to configuration, design, and build files would, uh, would fall in line for something about this analysis. So the next section, we'll be taking examples of some um, real-time disassemble packages, which um, uh, we all know show up the, the, the methods and the, the, the source code files. So this is an example of a send email class file. And here there is a regular email method for sending out an email. We are, uh, the, the method is calling out, uh, it's calling methods for adding senders, for adding the recipients, as well as uh, setting the subject and finally sending the email. So as I said, it looks regular, but uh, something is a little suspicious about the construct and uh, the method here. And that is a hard-coded email ID is added in the recipients. So this leads to a few more questions that why is there a hard-coded email ID in the recipients? Is this an automated email ID or does it belong to, uh, you know, is, is it a personal email ID? And if it is personal, is it somebody internal to the organization or external to the organization? Uh, what are the contents of the email that is being sent out? And uh, what is the purpose? So just by identifying one hard-coded value, we can uh, build up a case and do a data flow analysis to see if there is something further malicious or not, or maybe just um, bad coding practices. There is Another example, uh, in this particular file, it's called Noah's Java. The name itself looks like uh, something is not correct or probably we could uh, sign it off um, as a dummy file that's uh, not called, but it's just added in the, in the binary package. And honestly, this kind of a, a finding can be identified in a regular source code review. So we have highlighted uh, the username and password that is hard coded here, but just looking at the source code, we could just qualify it, uh, qualify this finding as um, as hard coded credentials in the source code file. Um, when we perform um, something like a malicious code detection or a software supply chain thread detection, we need to go one step further and investigate the config and the deployment files as well uh, to build up our cases to make it stronger. And here we see in the web deployment file, web.xml, the method that is used here, the class, no auth filter, it is defined in the deployment file. Um, in the web.xml file. So we know for sure that um, anybody who is using these credentials, username um, as username and the password as default password, they can um, bypass the regular authentication method and enter into an application. This uh, next example, um, the uh, malicious construct is right at the top. Um, it's actually uh, pretty easy to uh, spot. Um, and it is basically a form of uh, command injection. Um, we take a, a re get request parameter um, named folder um, and then just execute it on like a Windows system. Um, this might open up a directory or something like that. Uh, but of course, if you put in a directory name that doesn't actually exist, um, and a directory name that is a operating system command, um, then it'll just run whatever command you want. Delete all your files, copy files across to another system. You know, the Bob is your uh, uncle in this case. This is something that definitely would come up through a normal static analysis or just a normal code review or even a penetration test, and probably even a uh, dynamic uh, scan or something like that. Um, but what is uh, of interest here is this based off of a real finding that we had on an assessment um, was a problem that we found built into a separate uh, jar file. Um, so sometimes, you know, developers have access to code bases uh, late in the process, later than um, 
than should typically happen in an SDLC. Um, or, uh, you know, a developer will include something else from somewhere else, like O'Shawn Marshall said in the last session, um, almost all of your code is written by somebody else. Um, so uh, our analyses will be able to find these sort of mistakes that um, basically have propagated through the supply chain to you. And we have a last example for code method, and this is from a manager payment class file. Uh, this method is for basically processing the payment for an account manager, so basically one of the senior managers, and a simple code again, which um, includes uh, the branch number where uh, the payment should be processed for the account manager and the payment date. Uh, typically, we get a uh, get our payment after every ten business days, and that is what the second last line here, set payment date, um, is used for for setting the payment after every ten days. But and it, as I said, it looks regular um, at a, at a first glance. Um, it's not that easy to uh, catch this finding, but if we take a closer look. Um, something is not correct, and at times we also, when we do these um, kind of thread detections and it's on the production packages, uh, we may also have a background story on whether um, something is wrong in the in the payment systems. And just looking at the source code here, we see that this is not right. This is not for ten business days. Uh, there's a delay in the payment processing. So just to explain, one day has 86,400 seconds. So ideally there should be three zeros for 10 days, but there are four zeros here. So it is 8,640,000 that's added. So uh, there are some suspicious intents that we can build from here. One, that uh, it's done intentionally uh, maybe a disgruntled employee who does not want his manager to get his payment on time and it's delayed up to 100 days. Or secondly, um, it could be an, it could be accidental, a typo, an additional zero, and uh, it was not checked correctly. And third would be that it is accident, it's a combination of accidental and intentional. So first glance, accidental. Second, the manager complains that he does not receive the payment on time. And uh, so he gets uh, a payment after every 10 days from the finance system, but using the logic from the, from, the, from the source code or the binary package, he also receives a payment after 100 days. So basically he's not reporting that he's getting paid two times for every pay cycle. So these are some examples from uh, from real time source binary packages that we've seen. Uh, now let's look at the methodology. How do we go about identifying um, insider threats in the software supply chain? Just looking at the source code. Uh, this is more like building up a story. Uh, we know that the threat here is the software app team who has access to uh, the source code file. They are building the logic and knowing the threat the first area would be identifying key points of interest, which are basically atomic elements that we've also seen in the code could be hard coded values like a hard coded date, hard coded um, email ID, URL, or it could be using uh, stealth methods, which ideally should not be included in a source code file. So we identify those key points of interest. Next, from the points of interest, we check if there is a way that we can flow from those elements to a method that is being called for um, building out some suspicious method, some suspicious construct. So join the dots between the point of interest to the methods that are being called. Um, if we can join the dots, then let's go one step further and build out an intent that here there is something suspicious. It looks suspicious, but is this intentional or is this accidental. Um, it could be that the business, it, that there's a business justification. So it's not actually suspicious. 
and uh, it won't qualify to be uh, an internal threat or a malicious code. And finally, if we know that it is malicious, then uh, we take an action, which is which here we call next step, but it's it's the final uh, step in this methodology. So this is manual and uh, uh, performing a detection uh, would take, man, you know, doing something manually will always take time. So we need to automate and we have automated the first two steps. That is by building out signatures to join the dots from point of interest to suspicious construct. Uh, we can write automation scripts to um, in terms of regular expressions and custom rules to refine the data flow analysis. And here we have an example of a classic malicious code uh, that is inserted by a development team, uh, a backdoor. And uh, in simple terms, backdoor is nothing but an alternative non-standard uh, way of entering an app or an infrastructure, an organization. Um, let's take it as somebody entering our house, not from the main door, but from a window that is kept open. So same thing happens in applications and uh, uh, IT infrastructure as well. So a developer could use a stealth test utility to enter an application uh, through using a communication channel, which gives way to an inversion of control operation. Uh, it looks like he is uh, that rather I should, it could be he or she. So basically a uh, developer is using um, a functionality to build a command, which looks like uh, a which looks like a, par a command that's being built using static parameters because many sub methods are being called and it looks a little more surreptitious because of the way it's written, but actually he is building a command uh, dynamically, which can be executed on runtime and that could open up a shell axis. And we all know if there's a shell axis that's open, um, any uh, malicious, attacker could uh, get complete control on the system. So what do we do next once we know that there is a malicious intent in the system? Uh, here are some examples. Um, take no action, delegated, passive monitoring, active monitoring, and take immediate response. Um, um, we would rather have this as an interactive session, but uh, uh, since we cannot interact right now, uh, we can just uh, go over what, what should be the steps, and there is no wrong answer for this. All all these are steps to be taken, but uh, depends on the scenario. So first thing is that we do not take any steps. That is, um, it could be a false positive. There could be um, a business justification, as I've mentioned earlier. So it's not a malicious code. It's not an insider threat in the software supply chain. The next is um, it's, it's not a malicious code, but because we review source code files, we do often find implementation bugs, design flaws, the typical source code review finding. So instead of uh, uh, taking it further uh, to the to the next escalation point, we redirect it. So we give it back to the source code review team and say what we have identified. Uh, the second and third step would be for uh, uh, for finding out for, for finding out actual malicious intent, uh, so let's say that there's a possibility of exfiltrating data to an unwanted system or unauthorized system, but the data may not be extremely sensitive or critical. So we could have passive production monitoring by implementing some web application firewall rule, adding in some sensor and production logs to check whether data is actually being exfiltrated or not, 
uh, and if at all to whom it is being sent and accordingly take actions whether to further block this exfiltration or not. Um, if there's a possibility of uh, sending out or somebody being able to uh, access in some sensitive information, then best is to uh, take the active approach and have a compensating library in place or an active uh, workroom to block the access at the source. And final would be to take an immediate response in terms of escalation and getting the legal and the HR teams involved. That is if we can identify the culprit and it could also, and if genuinely there is and you know there's an internal culprit and a disgruntled developer who is uh, who is probably inserting a logic bomb or a backdoor. Uh, it could also lead to his um, work termination or termination of contract. So we have the results. We have gone through the methodology. Let's see who could perform this kind of uh, detection method uh, or this this threat detection. Um, here we have a developer, a hacker, and a security engineer. Um, again, I would have loved to have this as an interactive session, uh, but uh, there is no wrong answer again. Um, at the end, uh, the basic skills needed is you should be able to read source code, uh, the programming languages, and a developer, hacker, security engineer would all fit into this bucket, but a developer a typical developer would rather spend his time developing his application, not too worried about the security implications while developing the, the software. He has a timeline to complete and have the uh, production, uh, have the app up and running. Hacker, mm, always busy, you know, adding something malicious or, you know, an offensive attack. So you may or may not want to consider security engineer it is a part of his job to um, identify something uh, something malicious, but oftentimes security engineers work uh, looking at or you know just just work out of a checklist. And if we complete our checklist, we may not consider a lot of custom activities. So again, as I said, no right or wrong answer, but uh, we would like somebody uh, like a dev actor. Uh, to perform this kind of a threat detection. So a combination of a developer and attacker, as it's written, a smart developer with secure coding skills and mind of an attacker. With this, um, this we can uh, uh, talk. Um, we're going to go hit the Slack um, and try to answer some questions. Um, Thank you, you guys, so much for you guys, Thank you, you guys have a couple of minutes. If you see any questions in Slack. Oh, everybody's asking for your slides, which um, that's pretty normal. So if you guys want to um, provide your slides, everybody always wants that. And then note to all future talks, don't mute yourself on Zoom because then you get a <laughs> Mr. event to unmute yourself. <laughs> Every time I touch software, it breaks. This is <laughs> the story of my life. Sorry about that. I it's had a like, bunch uh, of that earlier because something was funky on a on, uh, 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 shed that like only affected me because I put my name <laughs> in one way and then the other way the other way or something. <laughs> it happens. Uh, like uh, Andy says, I hate computers. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, thank you. We appreciate your presentation today. It was great information. Um, thanks for um, supporting B-Sides with Nana. And if you guys have, if anybody has questions for them, they'll be in the connect track or you can uh, message them directly and talk more. So thanks y'all. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that. Thanks B-Sides. Thank you, welcome.